In 1849, the state of Wisconsin was just a year old, and like many struggling new states on the western frontier, it could barely afford to provide for the education of its children, estimated at the time to be just over 40,000 in number. There was no standard curriculum, and competent teachers were hard to come by. By the end of the Civil War, however, the number of these students had grown to a quarter million. Many of them were the children of new immigrants, and it became clear that what little was being done to improve education was insufficient if the state wished to thrive and grow prosperous. To rectify this in 1865, the state committed itself fully to the establishment of a system of normal schools in line with the international movement of such teacher training institutions. The Board of Regents, created to run the program, quickly made known its intention to place one school in each of the state's six congressional districts, and it entertained bids from all cities hoping to host a school. The first two schools were established at Platteville in the third congressional district and Whitewater in the first. The fifth district of northeastern Wisconsin was selected to be the location for the third school. Competition among the communities within the fifth district for the normal school was fierce. The cities of Berlin, Nina, Menasha, Amro, and even out-of-district Fond du Lac all placed attractive bids. Despite their best efforts, however, none could match the utility and advantage of locating the school in Oshkosh, which at the time was the state's second largest city. Still, after the city's selection in 1866, it would be two and a half more years before Oshkosh could agree upon and arrange Title IV, the location of the school, a delay that even forced the city to hold a referendum on whether or not the community wanted the school at all. The school supporters prevailed, and a location in the fields on the outlying Algoma Boulevard was selected for the location of the school. It was a local architect, William Waters, who designed the elegant normal school building. Delivered on time in 1869, the $44,000 structure would have been ready for classes in the fall of 1870 if the state had not run out of the funds necessary to staff and operate the school. The Board of Regents had no other choice but to allow the building to sit idle for one year, much to the disappointment of the residents of Oshkosh, who had given both land and $30,000 toward the construction of the school. At last, on September 19, 1871, a crowd of townspeople and dignitaries assembled in the school's theater. On hand was the man selected to be the first president of the Oshkosh Normal School. George Sumner Alby began his remarks by proclaiming that intelligence for the many, not the few, was to be their motto, a commitment to progressive education that still lies at the heart of the campus today. Registration continued throughout the year. Each student who applied was rigorously tested, then interviewed by Mr. Alby himself. By the end of the first year, 314 students had been enrolled. In its first few decades, life at the Oshkosh Normal School did not resemble what many think of as a typical college experience. There was a large diversity in ages of the students, for example. Many students came to the school with several years of teaching experience behind them, while some did not have high school diplomas. These students all lived at home or within the community, as there were no dormitories on campus. Students were kept to a strict code of conduct that was enforced both on and off campus. Students were warned against alcohol, tobacco, swearing, and gambling. Dancing was banned from campus until near the turn of the 20th century. In time, as their numbers grew, student life began to grow richer. Students began to organize themselves in social, academic, and professional groups. In the 1890s, Oshkosh Normal students began two important publications, the Advanced Newspaper and the Quiver Yearbook. These fixtures of Oshkosh student life would document the growth of athletics, cultural offerings, and campus traditions for years. The school's curriculum was also expanding. At the turn of the century, new specialized programs were added, 
such as domestic science and industrial arts, to meet new trends in education. The latter brought more men to campus, bolstering the school's sports teams. This steady development of student life and maturation of the school's mission was put to a severe test in 1916, when on the morning of March 22nd, a janitor discovered flames in the south wing of the normal school's main building. Problems with water pipes stymied the fire department, and after many hours that saw students and faculty rushing in and out to save important records, furniture, and books, the entire building was lost. The school lost only one day of classes, however, as city churches and later its high school became home to many classes for the next year and a half. By 1918, the school's new building, today's Dempsey Hall, was completed, and the development of the normal school took up its normal pace. By the state normal system's sixth decade, it was clear to many that the schools had become something much greater than what was first created in the 1860s. After a hard-fought campaign led by Oshkosh President Harry Brown, the state legislature passed a law in 1925 that gave the normals degree-granting status. Despite the lobbying against the bill from the University of Wisconsin and other colleges, the normals were finally able to give out baccalaureate degrees instead of certificates of completion, which transformed the schools into teachers' colleges and elevated the status of their students to many, particularly, prospective employers. This new status attracted a different type of student. During the Great Depression, students who might have attended the UW now flocked to Oshkosh to take pre-professional or general education courses. With no tuition and far lower fees and rent than in Madison, Oshkosh and its sister schools allowed hundreds of students to continue their education. The record enrollments the school enjoyed would prove to be temporary, however. The call to arms during World War II drained the campus of its male students. By 1943, fewer than 15 men remained on campus. Many female students who were challenged by the war economy and responsibilities also stayed away. Faculty and staff were laid off due to the shrinking enrollment. Social calendars of those female students still on campus collapsed. Businesses that benefited from the student presence also began to suffer. Fortunately, the 96th College Detachment, a training unit of the Army Air Corps, was stationed in Oshkosh to receive college and flight training. In their 16-month stay, the 96th brought over 1,200 men onto campus in groups of 400 at a time. In order to bring them all up to the same educational level, the soldiers took classes from rehired faculty. With the return of veterans on the GI Bill, the Oshkosh State Teachers College expanded its offerings beyond those solely associated with education. In another far-reaching piece of legislation, the state, in 1949, made it possible for the teachers' colleges to grant degrees in liberal arts. These degrees, in addition to pre-professional programs that had to be completed at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, greatly increased the attractiveness of the school to local students and to veterans. To reflect its broader mission, the school became Wisconsin State College Oshkosh. This name would prove to be short-lived, the wave of veterans was soon followed by baby boomers, and to meet the needs of these students, more programs were developed at Oshkosh. By 1963, a graduate school was added. New colleges were created in business and health care, and the name was changed to Wisconsin State University Oshkosh. The influx of veterans and baby boomers did more than broaden the mission of the school. It also put pressure on campus facilities. To meet the needs of the ever-increasing number of students, a building drought that had begun in the mid-1920s was to come to an end. Over the next 15 years, no fewer than 27 buildings were added to campus. The changes to the fiscal landscape and academic curriculum of the college that began in 1949 
also included a second golden age of student life. It was in the 1950s and 1960s, for example, that many noteworthy campus traditions and organizations began, some of which still exist today. College sports developed beyond football, basketball, and baseball, including a slow development of women's sports after a long downturn. As the post-war happy days of the 1950s and early 1960s gave way to the turbulence of the late 1960s and early 70s, the university at Oshkosh found itself enmeshed in the lifestyle, politics, and even violence of that time. It is said that the 60s didn't reach Oshkosh until November 21, 1968, the day African-American students occupied President Roger Giles' office with a list of demands to make the campus more hospitable to people of color. While the demands had been made previously through more systematic channels, the immediacy of the students' timeline required Giles to refuse to sign their demands. Subsequent vandalism and arrests polarized the campus and damaged fragile race relations at school and in the community. From this incident grew the Multicultural Education Center, a commitment to diversity and a broadening of the school's curriculum still honored to this day. As the university entered its centennial year in 1971, it and the other state universities merged with the University of Wisconsin, forming a single state system. The newly christened University of Wisconsin Oshkosh now featured a seven-year-old graduate school that was gaining prominence in numerous fields. Thirty-seven buildings graced the campus. Plans were even underway to add Ph.D. programs. As the 70s progressed, economic and other realities required the university to hone its mission and to concentrate upon its strengths. To do so, it looked inward at the way it developed and attracted its faculty and staff. A professional development program and a school calendar offering periods for research and interim courses were two lasting legacies of the short career of Chancellor Robert Birnbaum. Investment in emerging technologies has enabled the campus to remain current and relevant to its students. Over the years, UW Oshkosh has adjusted its mission and created new programs, institutes, and degrees that keep its curriculum and services salient to the marketplace of ideas and jobs. Finally, over the past 10 years, during very challenging economic times, and under the leadership of Chancellors John Kerrigan and Richard Wells, the campus has continued to look inward and to reinvest in its aging facilities. The new student union renovated Halsey Science Center, soon to be completed Student Health and Wellness Center, and a new academic building are all evidence of the university's growth and ability to create facilities that match and improve the outstanding work being performed inside of them. At the same time, the university has engaged the community by working with regional businesses to provide university solutions to local industrial and commercial problems while strengthening scholarship and internship opportunities for its students. Communications between the university and community organizations regarding projects and programs of mutual interest are a daily occurrence. The faculty, staff, and students contribute to the community by working, volunteering, serving, and healing. The students, staff, and faculty work to expand knowledge and to improve the area's social, cultural, and educational environment. The campus community takes part in the city. It also brings the city to campus through its guests, concerts, exhibits, classes for retirees, weekend degree programs, and social services. As part of the nationally recognized UW system, UW Oshkosh believes in the Wisconsin idea the 110-year-old tradition that our university should benefit everyone in the state, not just those on campus. UW Oshkosh collaborates with regional organizations and communities and serves as an economic engine by contributing more than $500 million to the region annually. The university also brings value in terms of community building, human capital, and brain power, markets and market opportunity, knowledge and ex expertise, and regional quality of life. I encourage you to get to know our campus, get to know the, our mission, enjoy the many opportunities to connect, 
try a sporting event, a theater production, or a musical performance, I am proud to be a part of UW Oshkosh, and I hope you'll be too.